Well, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to host uh, Anurag uh, Behar from the Azim Premji Foundation this afternoon. Um, uh, Anurag, well, I, should, I would like to say Anurag needs no introduction, but I think um, I'm going to say something about Anurag, uh, about why um, uh, I felt it would be in incredibly important for us to hear what he, what he has to say about, the, about public education and also about what he at the Azim Premji Foundation has been doing uh, <clears throat> in the context of public education. Um, well, Anurag uh, has, uh, you know, held several positions at the at the at the, at the uh, Wipro uh, at the company Wipro, um, and has you know led many teams and brought them to br brought tremendous uh, success to many of the uh, activities that he was involved in at at Wipro uh, before he um, be became in charge of the. Uh, I guess it was the CSR uh, activities at Wipro that, and the sustainability activities uh, at Wipro that, uh, in fact, led him to take on um, a, a much more challenging program at the uh, Azim Premji Foundation. Uh, he's also the vice chancellor of the Azim Premji University, if, um, which I'm sure he's also going to talk about and the mandate of the Azim Premji University. Um, well, besides the activities that he does, uh, um, in the context of the Azim Premji Foundation and the university, uh, he's also on the board of um, several uh, other companies. On the, uh, on the board of the Wipro GE Healthcare Limited of of the Te and also on the Terry University, he serves on various government and industry councils. Um, in particular, in the context of education, um, on the national mission on teachers and teacher education, on the um, and he was uh, on the Government of India Implementation Committee for the Justice Verma Commission that we had heard about here um, and, and the context of that uh, commission in this very hall. Um, <clears throat> he's also been uh, involved in the National Climate Change Council and been honored by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. Um, uh, well, he'll... Uh, uh, but, but, but for all that, uh, um, Anurag... Uh, is an avid jogger, and if you uh, are awake um, early morning, you might actually see him at our gates, uh, I guess, every day. So Anurag, uh, in fact, uh, finds the GKVK campus in our, in our gate a great attraction because he jogs here every morning. And so we thought we'd bring him, in, bring him a little further in and uh, have him tell us about what he does. Anurag. Good evening. I'm clear at the back? All right, good evening. Uh, I was just uh, having a chat with uh, Savita, Jitu, and Suhail as to what should I really talk about. Uh, when I say what should I talk about, what should I emphasize? Uh, so on the basis of what we uh, sort of jointly decided, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the public education system here in India. When I say public education system, I refer, I'm referring to the school system, not the higher education system. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the issues that are there. Uh, and then I'll sort of lead up to what does the Azim Premji Foundation do? And perhaps towards the end, I can also briefly allude to what, uh, what we are trying to do together uh, with uh, NCBS. So uh, you see. School education is a kind of a thing that uh, pretty much all of us have gone through, right? Otherwise, most of you won't be here. Uh, so the problem that presents for me is that it makes me completely uncertain about what is the level of familiarity that a group of this nature would have with the issues of school education, right? What I'm going to assume is that you have a, a newspaper level of familiarity meaning you read newspaper stuff around school education. I'm not going to assume anything more than that. And in case you're deep into education, please pardon me for whatever, the first few minutes about this. Is that all right? OK, all right. So uh, let me actually tell you something about 
let me characterize the Indian schooling system first for you, right? And I'm talking about the entire schooling system, public and private. Uh, India has about 1.6 million schools, okay? India has about 205 million children inside those schools. India has about, uh, about 8 million teachers teaching in those schools. India has another million other people involved with the school education, head teachers, curriculum people, so on, whatever, you know, uh, block education officers. Now, that's not surprising. It's not surprising because given the size of our country, the population, we are likely to have a, a large system. But that seemingly large system, it hides many things. What it hides is, for instance, one, we have a staggeringly large system. China, with about the same number of children in schools, about the same number of children in schools, has 700,000 schools. So we have 1.6 million odd schools, and China has 700 odd thousand schools, right? What does this tell us immediately? That somehow our school sizes are much smaller, right? The average number of children in our schools is much smaller than China. And that's because of a policy decision we took 25 years ago. And the policy decision at that point in time was a very wise decision. And the policy decision was that we will make sure that we have a school in 0.8 kilometers of every habitation in this country. Absolutely every habitation in this country. What that has led to is that every village in this country, every small habitation, actually has a school, a primary school in walking distance. China took a different policy decision. China said, we'll bus our children from around into one central location. They have larger schools. I'll come back to what kinds of issues and complexity this kind of a policy decision now faces us with, right? I'll come back to that in a bit. However, let me take you a little bit forward. I said, we have a staggeringly large system. We have, but we have a staggeringly complex system. And that complex schooling system is merely reflective of the incredible, enormous diversity that we have, this country has, right? I'll just take a few illustrations. I cannot be exhaustive. You could come here. Please. I feel happier, actually, otherwise. <laughs> you know, I thought at least in a place like NCBS with all these wonderful scientists, not everybody would be a backbencher. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, we talked about this, I talked about the staggering size, huh? but, and I'm going to come back to the other issues revolving around that, but I'm going to now talk about the staggering complexity that Indian schooling system has, right? Uh, and I cannot be exhaustive about this complexity, I'm just going to illustrate it with a few things. Uh, any typical classroom in this country, when the teacher goes in, the teacher is teaching in one of about 19 mediums of instruction, which is, you know, Kannada or Gujarati or Hindi or whatever, right? Now, guess what? Wherever you go inside the classroom, do you think those children speak that language? Grade one? Rajasthan, what is the medium of instruction? Hindi. You think children speak Hindi in grade one? They don't. They will speak Mewadi, Marwadi, Bhili. They will speak all kinds of languages. So imagine this classroom where you have this single teacher going in, 40 kids in the classroom, the 40 kids, of course, don't know how to read and write. They also, also speak five different languages, right? Next, about 65% of kids in our schools are first-generation school goers, right? What does it mean? It's a big thing. What it means is that their parents, in the home environment, they do not have educational support, right? And we know, and there is research, and there is, of course, I mean, you don't need research for this. It's just common sense that, you know, home environment also has a significant role to play on education, right? But that's what we face, our country faces. 65% children, first-generation schoolgoers, right? Let's talk about other complexities. Imagine the kind of migration that is there, right? Agri agrarian migration, construction migration. What happens to those children? You know, we're talking about millions of children. We're not talking about a few thousands here, right? How are they dealt with? Let's now think about some other things. And these things don't go away because we are what we are. In this country, even today, 
outside, and not just outside, but even in the city of Bangalore, caste, religion, uh, gender, any category that you can think of, discrimination is rife, right? So that is a reality. Now, can we wish it away? Of course we must fight against it, but it is there, right? It's there out there, because it's as much a part of society, right? So I'll st stop there for a minute. So we have this staggeringly large system, never ever, I mean, you, know, can, you can say this about anything in, in India, but never ever in human history has anything been attempted at this scale to try and educate people, 205 million children, with this degree of complexity that we are dealing with, right? Now, Newspaper headlines would have told you many things. Your personal experience and personal opinions might also be in the same light. Which is this, that when we talk about India schooling, we are basically always you know, crying about the low learning levels or poor learning levels. You must have read about it, yes or no? Asar, right? That India's children are not learning, our school education is in very poor shape, and so on and so forth. That's true, that if you look at fifth grade children across the country, perhaps about 50-60%, depending on what survey you're talking about, 50-60% 50, of our children are not able to read and write, grade appropriate, right? So we have, a, we have a very significant problem of, let's call it learning, right? Learning in, in that narrow way at this moment. I'll expand the meaning of learning subsequently, right? So we have, we have a huge problem. However, when we keep crying about this matter of the school education system being poor, learning outcomes being inadequate, grossly in inadequate, we actually tend to, uh, should I just go on? Yeah. Okay, all right. So we tend to either forget, and often we actually don't know. What we don't know is what is the staggering progress India has made in the past 25 years in school education. So we have made absolutely staggering progress. I'll talk about three dimensions of progress that India has made, which is as staggering as our scale. Right? One, do you know how many, what percentage of Indian children are in schools now? In schools? Take a guess. Sorry? So 85, 95. 50, right? Okay, great. Well, 99% Indian children are in schools. Okay? 99% Indian children are in schools. Right? Now, just listen to this. Just listen to this carefully. Okay? Listen to this carefully. This number is called the enrollment rate. 99%, right? What was the enrollment rate in 1985, 30 years ago? What was the enrollment rate? 45%, right? The enrollment rate was 45% in 1985. In 30 years, we have reached 100%, right? It's not a small achievement. We don't understand that, right? It's totally staggering. If you think of what might have been the situation today had the enrollment rate been the same as in 1985? How many children would have been out of school? 105, 105 million children would have been out of school. Now we've got the children in schools, right? We've got them in. You know, uh, when many of us would have been young, a lot of you are much younger, many of us when you would have been young, we were always hearing this, that the last outpost of civilization in this country is what? The post office. Right? Have you? There are lot too many young people here. <laughs> but there's some gray. <laughs> the last outpost is post office, right? Have you heard this? Yes or no? Well, you, you may not have. <laughs> Today, I can tell you the last outpost of civilization is the government primary school. Come with me to Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Assam, Nagaland. Come with me anywhere you wish to, right? And you will see a decent, pakka government primary school out there. So we've got our children into schools. I can't say every state, I can't say every village, but in a very large percentage of this country, we have reasonable schools, right? There's a lot wanting there. I'll give you an example which you'll read about, that there are no to not adequate toilets, there's no running water, there's not, 
there is no toilets for girls, and which has an implication on you know, gender enrollment subsequently. Yes, we have problems. But you think from where we have come, right? Where we have come to where we are today. So we made staggering progress. Is it okay to ask you a flat relation? Yeah, sure. I mean, is it 99% for primary school, or is it for? No, it's primary. Up to, it's, it's primary school. Primary school. And, and then you, I mean, I'll, yeah. So what happens is that then there's a dropout rate, which is pretty, pretty bad, right? So, but 99% is primary, so grade, up to grade five, right? Uh, so 45%, I'm, I'm comparing apples to apples. Huh? So if you go to high school, it'll be, again, different numbers. So we've got almost all our children in schools. One dramatic bit of progress. Second, right? And second, second is equally interesting. Huh? What it means, getting all children into schools, is not just the matter of getting all children into schools. It's also been a big battle with social attitudes and norms. Because what's happened, and I'll give you another interesting piece of data, gender parity, right? If you have 99% children in school, that means that almost all girls are also in schools, right? That's obvious. But if you look at gender parity, gender parity till 1995, 93, 95, was almost 65, 70%. Meaning for every 100 boys, there were only 65, 70 girls in school. So something we've done, Something, not one thing, but hundreds of things we have done in this country by which we have worked much more on girls, much more on so-called lower caste, much more on religious minorities, you know, by which we have actually got pretty much everybody into school, right? We have not eliminated discrimination. We have not done that. As much in homes, as much in classrooms, there continues to be discriminatory behavior, right? But we've passed that first post, which is we've got everybody in schools. That's second. Third, third, and this one is quite remarkable. And uh, I'm guessing that uh, some of you may be familiar with this, which is this that, you know, our education policy, and let's say mostly reflected in our curriculum, right, is very progressive. And when I'm using the word progressive, I'm not using it as, an, as a political statement, but let me just call it good, right? There's very hard to find fault with it. So I would say the central document, if you're keen on it, is something called the National Curricular Framework 2005, NCF 2005, right? Now, if you look at that and all policies associated around that, it's wonderful. What is, for, let's take an example, right? Our curricular framework is actually quite clear that education is about the child's development in all dimensions. All dimensions means Social, cognitive, physical, emotional, ethical, right? Uh, for instance, our curricular framework is quite clear that one of the central goals of education must be the development of an autonomous human being, right? And that's saying a lot, okay? Uh, but let me not go that direction. All I'm saying is that if you were to look at our curricular direction and curricular frameworks, it is very hard to find any fault with. So we've made I just pointed out three things where we have made remarkable progress, but which we are unfamiliar with. All, all kids in schools, all kinds of uh, discrimination, at least eliminated in the context of getting pe kids into schools. And then, and then this matter of how our curriculum is, right? So I talked about the scale, complexity. I talked about what progress we've made. Let me go back to then what are the problems, right? Problem one. Problem one I already talked about. That, well, while we've got all the kids in schools, learning is not happening, right? And not, not even learning in that wonderful way that I talked about, which is emotional, cognitive, ethical development of the child, but very basic stuff, which is reading, writing, math is not happening. Right? That I talked about. That's one. Second, what Suhail referred to, which is that there's a huge dropout. So of 100 kids which are in grade 5, eventually only 40 go into grade 12. Right? So there's a massive dropout. And in the dropout, you can see gender difference. So the dropout rate of boys is almost 10 percent points higher than that of, uh, I'm sorry, that of girls is 10% point higher than that of boys. And so is the case with 
all socially, socially disadvantaged groups that their dropout rates are higher, right? So you've, you've, what's happening is you've got kids in schools, but they're not learning, and they're not even completing schooling, right? That's what is happening. So that, that's, that's essentially the most important problem that we face. Another problem. Another problem is, even to the extent that learning is happening, and we are all familiar, I mean, all of you who have come from the Indian schooling system are reasonably familiar with this, which is this that, you can come here, please. Please, 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 please. All of us are familiar, which is this that, whatever we are calling learning, most of it is actually what? It's just cramming, yeah? It's just rote memorization, right? I'll give you a very interesting thing that we discovered over the, I think Suhail is familiar with this because he's been, I and mean, we've been working together on a few things. That for the past 15 years, every four or five odd years, we've been, a, we've been doing a learning assessment survey. We've been doing one, not like the Asar. This learning assessment survey is different. What it does is, in the five big cities of this country, we poll the average middle class, upper middle class person, people like us, right? We poll them. What we ask you is, Tell us the 10 best schools in your city, or 15 best schools in your city, right? So people like us, we will list, what will we list? We'll list with their shelf, we'll list uh, whatever, you know, uh, huh? NPS and Aditi Malaya, and we'll end up with a list like that, right? 15 schools, 20 schools. We got 160 schools, every survey about the same number has come up. What we do is, we actually run the standardized assessment modules uh, with children in those schools, the best schools of this country, by the way, which the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, uses, which is run by OECD, right? Which measures student learning achievement across 64 countries, right? India doesn't participate in it. We take the same instruments, and we do it with these so-called 150 best schools of the country, right? Please remember, these are best schools. Perhaps your children go there, right? The, uh, the average learning level of these schools is lower than the OECD average. Okay? These are our best schools. Let me take you one level deeper. Even that average is actually disproportionately pushed up by children responding very well to what can be called procedural questions. What does it mean? Anything that we have to mechanically do, wrote, memorize, our children do well. The moment it comes to thinking, the moment it comes to applying, the moment it comes to analysis, we are actually way behind the OECD average. And please remember, I mean, OECD is not just Sweden and Finland. OECD is also Italy and uh, uh, you know, lots of other countries. You know? So it's not as if you just look at the top two countries and say, oh, well, they are somewhere far away. It's a large group of countries. And our best schools are in that shape. Now, so. Children enter, but they drop out. There is huge variation across socially disadvantaged groups. And the fact is, whatever learning is happening is actually rote learning, right? So we have a huge problem. However, every time I say this, it's there at the back of my mind. But since you people don't work in this, I want to reiterate every time that I say this, right? Let's not forget the progress we have made. And the reason we should not forget the progress that we have made Anybody, anyone here from Finland? Anybody who's lived in Finland? Right? No. Okay. You know, you must have heard that Finland is supposedly the best schooling system in the world, right? You must have heard that, right? Finland has a population of five and a half million, right? Uh, you could, you could come here, please. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I'm slowly filling up the front rows. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So five and a half million is the Finland, po Finland population. Finland decided, Finland went through a huge civic debate in the 50s and 60s. And the question essentially was, and you know, it's a complex question, but essentially was, what kind of education should we have? Right? What should be our education policy? So they debated it almost for 10, 10 odd years, 10, 15 odd years. They came to a sort of a settlement in 65. From 1970 onwards, they've been implementing the same policy. Right? Same policy. It has taken Finland, five and a half million population, about 5,000 schools. One of our districts has 5,000 schools. Huh? Right? It has taken Finland 40 years, 
Finland 40 years to get from where they were, which is pretty much our state, to where they are now. Right? So a country of our size and our complexity, if we take another 40 years, it's all right in my view. Right? There's nothing surprising about it if we actually take that long. Right? So the point is, there are huge problems, but let's not forget the progress that we have made. Right? I'll take you a few levels deeper on what is our assessment. And when I say our assessment, I'm not meaning only the Azim Premji Foundation, but I'm saying the wide, a reasonably widespread consensus about what is the problem arising from, or what are the kinds of things the problems are arising from. Right? Before I go there, I want to knock on one faithfully, one dearly held myth that people like us have. Right? That myth is this, that private schools are better than government schools. Right? Private schools are not better than government schools. Okay? And the moment I say this, if you're, you start envisioning Aditi Malaya, I'm not talking about Aditi Malaya. Right? There are some five Aditi Malayas in this country. The kind of, that kind of a school will be, you know, 0.0001%. Most of the private schools that I'm talking about is where most children who go to private schools go to. Right? You can walk around in Jakur, wherever you live, and see, you'll see very many of them. Right? The learning outcomes in private schools are not better than the learning outcome in government schools. They are the same. Right? I'll give you a few interesting uh, matters of uh, detail. Right? Uh, actually, before I go there, I'll tell you one interesting fact. Uh, I'm sure you're unfamiliar with this, that uh, we just lost the world championship uh, of cricket to, I mean, you're familiar with this, huh? sorry. <laughs> we, we, we lost the world championship of cricket to Australia, but we continue to be the world champion on this matter by miles. Huh? Amongst all functioning states in this country, uh, in this world, functioning states, and I think we are a functioning state, you know, we are not a failed state, but amongst all functioning states in this world, India is the world champion in the number of children in private schools, percentage. Huh? We have 30% children in private schools, right? Uh, pick any country you want, US 10%, Japan 5%, UK 6%, uh, Germany, you know, whatever, seven percent, some some stuff like that, right? You will, China, three percent, and the, so the, you might have one country, one small country, which might be higher, right? But that is the kind of percentage that we actually have in private schools. Also, what we tend to forget here is that surprisingly enough, most of Indian Indian private schools are for profit, right? All these schools that I'm talking about in France or Germany or Japan or wherever, most of them are not for profit, right? So most Indian private schools are for profit. That's point two. Point three is this, that when you read the headlines, and I, I'm sure you might, huh, that private schools are performing better, right? What you don't read there is something that for, you know, for, for once I don't have to explain this matter here with this crowd, which is this, that if you control for socioeconomic background, right? If you control for socioeconomic background, then the learning outcomes are the same. Because the fact is that there is a significant socioeconomic background difference amongst children that go to private schools and government schools. That's it. Right? So the moment you control that out, the learning outcomes are the same. Right? Uh, actually, you know, because that's my life. Every day, that's what I do. I go to schools and I work. The truth is, the government schools are better, right? Not on learning outcomes, but I'm telling you, if you go to government schools, you'll find the children happier, right? They're just happier. It's just, just a nicer place, right? Um, you know, I'm not. How many of you understand Hindi? Huh? Many, right? So if you go to a private school, no, wah, they are. वो लोग बैठे होते हैं अपने गल अपने गल्ले पर, ठीक है? कितना आओ पैसा दो जाओ, right? Uh, and you know, Jitu was kind enough to tell you about my, uh, you know, whatever, my dark past. <laughs> Basically, I've worked all my life in the private sector, right? For profit world. So there's nothing, I have no bias. We've got to make money somewhere, right? But both economic theory, right? Economics 101, basic economics, huh? Economist here? Any economist? 
Thank you. <laughs> a great credit to you, Jitu. Okay. So basic economic theory tells you education is a quasi-public good. It cannot be delivered by markets. Why do we Indians have this stupid notion that private schooling will actually solve whatever problems we have in schools? It does not. Basic economic theory, every evidence, the same OECD, which is basically a cozy club of, club of market-friendly countries, OECD is telling everybody, right, what is wrong with you guys? You don't understand that competition and market mechanisms do not work in schools, right? The only way out is public or philanthropic investment, right? So what I want to knock down, what I wanted to knock down is private schools do not are not the solution for this country, right? Yes. When you say private schools, government schools, are, I mean, uh, where do those schools which are funded by government but run by trust stand? Because there's municipal schools, uh, which, you know, as you say, okay, that's the last outpost, and that's the municipal or government school. Government school, yeah. So where do, where do these? Because I think our concept of government school is a municipal school. And so. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, India is this gloriously bewildering country of all these uncertainties, right? So it's very hard to classify. Uh, when I am characterizing like this, I am characterizing schools run by the government, whether the municipal or the state government or run by the government. There are very many aided schools. They are called aided schools, right? There are very many aided schools. Nevertheless, the percentage of aided schools is relatively small. Relatively, right? It's relatively small. It's either private schools or it's government schools in the way I'm calling it. Some states have more aided schools. Those of you who are from Kerala will know that Kerala has a lot of aided schools. So some states have a lot more aided schools. Some states do not, right? Now, let me go on. Huh? Let me go on to, therefore, since I've talked about the private schooling stuff, you know, I'm going to keep it away. I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about, so then what is the problem? Right? What is the problem? I mean, we got schools in, I mean, we got the kids in schools, we got a wonderful curriculum. So what is the problem? Right? Problem one. Problem one is this, that this again is something that you will, you know, I won't have to belabor here in this crowd. Right? Which is this. Problem one is that education, school education, as much as higher education, is very hard. Right? If you try to teach your kid Right? You'll know how tough it is. If you try to teach two of your kids, you'll know how impossible it is. Right? <laughs> now, imagine this person going into a classroom with 30, 40 kids who don't speak your language, you know, who have come often hungry because the only meal they get actually is the lunch at the school. Right? And they are and they are ill, they are hungry, something is going on. Now you're expecting the single teacher there to actually teach. And those kids should learn, and the, all the transformation should happen in 10 years, right? What are we talking about? We are berserk, absolutely. These are expectations. So education is hard, very hard. Huh? And what education requires, at, you know, if you throw away everything, what education requires is a good teacher. You didn't have a school, you didn't have classroom, you didn't have toilet, you didn't have this, you didn't have that. If you had good, committed, teachers, right? Education can somehow happen, right? Now, what does good committed teacher mean? I'll take you step by step. First, what it means is that you prepare the teacher well. And this is a central issue, and I'm going to come back to that. That you can't take me and say, okay, now teach grade one and grade three kids. You can't do that, right? I don't know how to do it. My job is managing organizations and people. I can't do that. You can't do it. Huh? I can challenge you. Huh? You just can't do it. So teachers have to be prepared well, point one. Point two, teachers have to feel motivated. How do they feel motivated? How will you feel motivated? Why do you feel motivated for your research? Right? Does somebody tell you do this? Right? Do this research. <laughs> Doesn't happen, right? <laughs> okay. There's no difference between a teacher and you. That's the heart of the issue. We don't understand that, right? There's absolutely no difference between the teacher and you, right? We don't understand it. We meaning society doesn't understand it, right? Unless a teacher is continuously reflective, continuously thinking, continuously growing, right? 
she can't be effective, right? So we do not think of the teaching profession, and therefore everything around the teaching profession, which is the bureaucratic system, societal expectations, that have all made it this mechanical role, which it is anything but that, right? By the way, one of the reasons Finland's education works so well is how differently they think about a teacher. You know what they think about the teacher? They think, their society thinks that teaching is by far the most creative profession. More than biology research, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that, I'm just pulling your leg, I don't throw me out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that helps. I mean, that is the heart of the matter. Because then what you're doing is, you're saying, look, this is the most creative profession. The most creative people, it's not a, it's not a money issue, huh, by the way. And you see, I've already gone into some 33 minutes, huh? so I can't, I can't tell you everything. So for instance, compensation of school teachers is not a problem in our country. Huh? That's not the problem. Private schools do play pathetically, right? But government school teachers are paid well. So those are not problems. The problem is, if you think of the teacher's role as this mechanical thing and not you know, this reflective, deep practitioner that the person must be, then everything around, you know, the bureaucratic system treats that person as the lowest person in a hierarchy. Everything is blamed on that person. She is kicked around all the time, right? Society thinks of it in the way we think of it, right? So on. So one, how is the teacher prepared? Two, why and how and how much is the teacher motivated? Of course, there are many things that play into it, as must be obvious. I'm just sort of putting everything in shorthand. But the fact is, how do we think of the role of a teacher, right? So that's the second point. Third. Third is this, that uh, actually the third I leave, leave for a bit. Okay? I'm, coming, I'm going to come back to it. Now I'll, I'll just talk, I'm going to talk for five minutes more. Huh? No. Huh? Have to. But then we can't talk. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to come back to the issue of teacher preparation, which to my mind, huh? and while they may not, not everybody in school education will have the same degree of emphasis as me, but there's a pretty much clear consensus in this matter. The heart of the matter in this country is this that our teacher preparation is pathetic, right? Absolutely pathetic. How long is a B.Ed., which is what makes you a teacher? How long? What is the duration? And I'm taking the most simplistic measure, duration. Sorry? One year. One year. Yeah. Sorry? Wow, you want to join the foundation? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> okay, all right. So, I'll, 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 you know, it used to be nine months. Nine months, right? Nine months. You see, the average teacher preparation program, the average teacher pre preparation program in the world is about four and a half years, right? We used to get young people and put them through some nine month stuff and say they become teachers. Okay, so I'm, this is only one level. Huh? I'll go, I'm going to take you to the depths of this issue, really, <laughs> in some senses. Now, just think of this. Not only do we take them through nine months, we have an even stranger thing. We have, the even stranger thing is those who are teaching elementary classes, grade actually pre uh, pre pre uh, pre grade one and one through six. You know what? What we expect of them is that they actually do 12th and then go through some uh, one and a half year diploma and then they become teachers. B.Ed. is actually for higher classes. Now how funny is this? It's a reasonably well understood thing that teaching young kids is more complex than teaching older kids. And we have a completely upside down system where we are expecting the 12th grade, you know, I don't know how many, anybody has a 12th grade kid, 11th grade? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Can, will you let him or her go and teach in one year time, these 40 kids? <laughs> <laughs> Would you do it? Are we doing it. We're doing it for 40 years now. Right? What is wrong with us? So we have a completely, I mean, ill-conceived, poorly designed uh, teacher education curriculum, curricular framework. We just have a mess out there. Right? Point one. But this is not where it stops. What happens is that, and I'll give you an interesting thing, huh? which is another interesting bit, bit of data. In 1993, uh, in 1993, 
India had 1,300 teacher colleges. 1,300 teacher colleges. Okay. Uh, in six, 1965, we had 1,200 teacher colleges. 1,200, 1,300. It is in that early 90s period when this grand expansion of schools happened, right? Grand expansion of schools happened, where all these one point or whatever one million schools were constructed across the country. Now, what do schools need? Teachers, right? But how much is the money? Only enough to make schools, right? So, what do you do? You know, by the way, that's also the great age of Manmohan Singh and Narasimha Rao liberalizing, right? So they said, oh, wow, well, get private capital in, you know? Private capital, does it come for philanthropy? Right? Rarely. Yeah? So what happened is, the number of private colleges shot up from 1,300-odd to 15,000, right, in 14 years, right? The colleges, the private teacher colleges, are worse than the private schools. Okay, <laughs> much worse. No, I'm not joking because I, I, you know you want a BA degree. You want a BA degree? No. <laughs> <laughs> give, give me, give me, give me thirty-six thousand or whatever, seventy thousand rupees. I'll get you a BA degree. You don't need to go anywhere, right? And where do you want it from? Jammu and Kashmir, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh. I can get you from any from anywhere. That is how it operates, right? So we have. Ill, uh, we have an ill-conceived, ill-designed teacher education system, and then on top of it, we've governed that entire sector so poorly that we have an absolute institutional mess out there, right? Now, if this is the way we prepare teachers, and then we have the bureaucratic system which treats teachers the way we do, is there any wonder why our children are not learning, right? There's no wonder. Now, there are all kinds of other issues. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to get into it. There are all kinds of other issues that are there, but if you if you look at a, what is it called the Pareto, right? If, the, if you look at the Pareto analysis of the issues involved, this is pretty much 75% of the issue, which is the pre the teacher education system, and then after that, the matter of how we are treating the teacher, right? That's it. Now, I'm going to I'm going to take five minutes, five seven minutes more about therefore what the foundation is doing, and then we sort of open it up. Is that all right? Hmm? Okay. Now, you know, I am deeply hopeful, I am completely confident that our public education system, without which there can be no good society, right? Uh, public education is a foundational to a democracy and good society, right? Without which there can't be a good society. Our public education system will improve, can improve, right? I have not the slightest hesitation with that. It's going to take time. You know, I don't think that while I am working for the next 20, 20 or 5 odd years, it will, it will become very good. It will keep changing, keep improving. It will not become very good. It might take 40 years. I am very, very hopeful. Why am I hopeful? I am hopeful because of what I see every day on the ground. Absolutely every day on the ground. Have you heard of this myth? And again, it's a myth. Huh? Have you heard of the myth that basically all government school teachers are absent? You know, they don't show up at school, right? It's just wrong, right? Now, how do you debate that? It's an empirically incorrect uh, thing. Right? So you hear of this 20, 25, 30% government school teachers are absent. There's nothing like that, right? Some 6% government school teachers are absent, 6%, right? Which is pretty much the same absenteeism rate that you'll find in a factory outside, right? Or wherever, maybe in NCBS also, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, right? There's nothing, in fact, every day that I go out there in the field, what I see is a set of remarkable people Right? Truly remarkable people braving every condition that I talked about, braving the fact that they're ill-prepared, they keep going back to the classroom for 35 years every day, and they keep trying to do their best. Right? It is absolutely remarkable. Truly remarkable, I can tell you, you know, I write a column in the newspaper called Mint, I can send some of it to you. Is this remarkable? Now, what we need to remember here is this that did you remember what, how many teachers are there in our country, I said? About 8 million. Now you tell me, if you pick 8 million people from a population of our side, 8 million people, wouldn't you find some good people and some bad people? Is there any way of sorting it out, saying that everybody is this great, committed, wonderful, great person? It won't work, right? So in the teacher population also, you have a normal curve, right? You have the disengaged you know, disenchanted, de demotivated lot, and you have this incredibly motivated lot. And you have the middle there, I would say, and my experience, I'll give you an experience, huh? 
interesting experience this is. And this experience is every month. You can come with me. Every month this happens to me. On a Sunday morning, right, I'll be in a place, let's call it Bayatu. Bayatu is somewhere near Barmer, right? It's some 40 kilometers from Barmer. In a place called Bayatu, on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, you will see 25 primary school teachers gathered, government school teachers, Sunday morning. So it's a holiday, right? They've come from distances which are almost 30, 40 kilometers. They've come on their own, meaning they've paid for their trip, right? Uh, they pay for their lunch. Now, what are they doing? What they're doing is, let's say there's a workshop going on on how to use a microscope. Right? Why have they come? Has anybody told them to come? No. So, why have they come? They've come there, and every time, every month I must be having, I mean, I'm participating in two such, three such meetings, and of course there are many more being held. Every time I ask them, why do you do this? Their answer is the same. And the answer is pretty simple, pretty much what you would say. Because I want to become a better teacher. Right? That is all. There is no great mystery to it. So I'll spend my time, my holiday, I'll spend my money, right? and I'll show up here because I want to become a better teacher. That's all. Nothing more. But that nothing more is actually all the story. Right? Which is, if we can make that happen, which means the teachers who are out there, if they can be supported in some way, because they have come through an ill-prepared system, right? Uh, or a system that prepares them not adequately, right? They've come through that. So if we can help the teachers out there in some way, right, it makes a dramatic difference. Dramatic difference. So when we started working, when the foundation started working in 2000, about 2000, we worked for eight, nine years, 10 years. We discovered many things. And therefore, we came to the way we work today, right? Uh, we are very privileged that Mr. Premji has been transferring pretty much most of his wealth to the foundation's endowment. So as things stand now, he's transferred 38% of the holding of Wipro to our endowment, which our endowment stands at about, uh, about 50, 52,000 crores. So we are by far the best funded uh, foundation in this part of the world, one of the best funded in the entire world. Now what is all that money used for? right? Uh, essentially that money is used because we are going about setting up, let's call them institutions, institutions across the country. What are these institutions? These institutions are being set up in the remotest, the most disadvantaged districts of seven states of this country. That's Uttarakhand, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, Bihar, uh, and parts of Telangana, right? Now what is this institution? So this institution is basically it handles a district or two, three districts around it. A district in our, in our country is a pretty big place. That institution is staffed with between 50 to 60 or 70 odd people. Who are these people? These people are basically people who can work with teachers to develop their capacity. Let's call them teacher educators. So there will be three, four people who, can be, who understand math, pedagogy, another two. You know, we have very few who understand biology, right? And uh, no, I'm, I'm serious about this, huh? dead serious. Biology, biology, physics is a huge problem. Uh, but language, math, biology, physics, chemistry, social sciences, right? So imagine, so I, I'll paint a picture. You want to go, you can go. Uh, Barmer, this exotic district out there in Rajasthan, most of it is desert, right? Huge district, geographically huge, 25 lakh, 2.5 million population. We've got about 70 people there who continuously work with government school teachers, head teachers, and other functionaries. How do they work? They don't work by training them. Training meaning getting them into a classroom and giving a lecture like this. They do all kinds of things. They'll go into their schools, work with them in the classroom. They'll conduct a work. These peer learning networks that I was talking about, the Sunday stuff, right? A lot of that is facilitated. Right? What are we trying to do? We're essentially trying to set up an in-service professional development system, right? Which supports the teachers who are already out there. Because even if you improve the B8 system, that is going to impact the system 30, 40 years later, because it'll take a while, right? We have 8 million teachers out there. How do you improve that? So one big part of the foundation's work, we are currently in about 50 districts. 
One big part of our work is that we are out there in these districts working every day with government school teachers and other people to try and improve the schools right there on the ground, right? Uh, I must tell you why am I calling them institutions or institutes? Because they're actually that. We don't run programs, unlike NGOs and so on. We don't do that. There's actually a campus, there's a building. People live there. Why? Because we are there forever. We are committed forever. So the people that I talked about in Barmer, our presence is there forever. Why? Because we don't think education changes in five years, right? It does take 15, 20, 25 years. So we're going to be there and support it as long as it takes. And I'm sure something else will come up 20, 25 years later. So if you imagine the foundation, seven states, these 50 districts, about 1,200 people who are spread across these places. Uh, going by what we wanted to do, we should have, we should have been 2,500 people. But we don't fi find people to recruit. Even if you find people to recruit, you can imagine who wants to go to Barmer, right? Who wants to go to um, you know, Yadgir? Who wants to, you know, you might go for mountaineering and white river rafting to Uttarkashi. But if I were to ask you to live in Uttarkashi, will you do that? You won't do it, right? So these are the kind of places we work in. So that's our work in the field, the foundation's work in the field. Our hope is that over the next uh, four years, these number of 1,200 that I talked about will go up to about 3,500, 4,000 people, 3,500, 3, 3, people, who then will be fully staffed across the, these entire states, right? One big part of our work. The other big part of our work is actually the university that we run, which Jidu talked about, right? The university is right here in Bangalore. Uh, the university currently offers a master's program in education, one in development, one in public policy, and we're just beginning the undergraduate program this year. Now the question is, what do we do with the university? Why do we run the university, right? The answer is quite simple. The answer is this, that, let's I'll give an example which is the simplest and I know the numbers with greater rigor, which is this, that, if you look at the Canadian higher education system, the Canadian, right? How, what is the population of Canada? 35 yeah, 33 million, yeah, right? So 33 million population. Uh, it's a much smaller country than ours. You also might be familiar that Canada has a pretty good schooling system, right? It may not be Finland, but it's a very good system. It's a very good, especially Ontario, uh, very, very good system, right? Now, Canada with that population, can you imagine how many people are coming out of graduate programs in education in Canada? How many people are coming out of graduate? Graduate means masters and PhD, right? And therefore, what am I talking about? Let's call these people education experts, meaning people who can work on curriculum, who can devise assessment systems, who can actually write textbooks in a certain way, and so on and so forth. How many do come out every year in Canada? The number is 2,000, right? What is the number in India? Till we started our university, that number was 150, right? The same number, approximately, for the US is about 20,000. 20,000 US, 2,000 Canada, we have something like 150. Now it's about 400, 450, because we set up the university, right? What has happened? And that reflects everywhere in this country. Any school meeting that you go to, and Suhail has been to some meetings along with me, you will see the same people, right? Can you imagine? I mean, it might be happening in biology, huh? so I don't know. <laughs> but the fact is, in school education, you go, to, you go to curriculum meeting, you go to this meeting, go to that meeting, and go to Cochin, go to Delhi, go to Guwahati, it's the same 20 people, right? It's not their fault, it's the country's fault. We've never worked, we've never taken higher education on the matter of school education seriously. So when India thought and invested into the engineering college architecture in the 50s, 60s, right? or subsequently in the law school architecture uh, in the early 90s, we didn't think about higher education and school education, and which is why we are at the state where we are. So, well, this thing started hurting us a lot by you know, the first three, four of years of our work. We realized that uh, everybody who works in school education has the same problem, including the government, right? The government is struggling to staff what their institutes of education are. There are 62% vacancies there. 62%. And the 38% that are filled, they're also filled by people who have no relevant qualification, right? So we said, well, okay, this is needed. A higher education institution focused on the matter of school education is needed. We said, we'll set it up. And that's how the Azim Premji University was born. What happened was that when we started thinking about the matter of the university, 
we realized that the university is not going to be a bunch of faculty members who have worked only in school education. It is going to be a multidisciplinary faculty. We'll have the philosopher, the physicist, the mathematician, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, if you're going to do that, we started thinking and we went back to the origin of the foundation. We didn't start the foundation thinking that we want to improve school education. We started the foundation thinking, how do we contribute to a better country? And better to us meant equitable, humane, and a just country. Right? That's what it meant, our constitutional ideals. So when we started thinking like that, we said, well, that's what, that is our actual goal. We thought of school education as a vehicle towards that goal. Now we are setting up the university, and the university is multidisciplinary. Then why limit the mandate of the university only to school education? Why not all dimensions of human development? What I mean by that is, why not health and nutrition? Why not governance? Why not environment, ecology, and sustainability, and things of this nature? Why not all that? And that's how the Azim Premj University, when it got set up, finally got set up with this mandate of doing programs, research in education, and other related human development areas. Right? So now if you look at the foundation, the privilege that we have is one man's generosity. Right? And that generosity is not, is not limited only to the fact that there's a lot of money, but also this that uh, there is a willingness to do something which is extraordinarily long. Huh? I mean, I, I, I hope you can imagine this. Huh? How hard is it for him right? when he says, look, all this money is there but I see no change. <laughs> so you keep doing something, but nothing happens. Right? This is an everyday conversation between us. Right? Why? Because it takes 25 years. Can anything else be done? No. It will take 25 years, 30 years. Right? So if that's the right thing to do, do it. Right? Now, we are just privileged that we have that. And that is required. All our colleagues, all our colleagues who work in school education, everybody wants to do similar things or is doing similar things right is is doing similar things uh, we we as i have already said we don't think that one foundation is sufficient in any way for the issues facing school education in this country right not at all there are perhaps hundreds of organizations like ours that are required by the way the government of india pushed by many of us woke up about 3 years ago and they said that they will invest into 30 schools of education. They call it schools of education inside existing central universities. So the gap that I talked about, you know, because of which we set up Danzi Premier University, hopefully that will be bridged. Of course, uh, that's the current government policy pronouncement. It will take a bit for the funding to happen and the institutions to be set up, 10 years maybe. But it will get done. right? So all I was saying was, we don't think, we have no hopes that we are uh, in any way sufficient. Forget the entire country, even for a particular state. We think, we believe that a huge amount of work together is required. Part of that work, part of that work must be with research and higher education institutions such as yours. Right? I was telling Jyutu this when we met about four or five weeks ago, that some of the most remarkable work in school education that happened in this country happened in the mid-70s. Right? Mid-70s, early 80s, in a place called Hoshangabad. Anybody heard of it? Right? Hoshangabad. Hoshangabad Science Teaching Program. Right? How did it happen? It did not happen because school education people were working there alone. It happened because people actually from TIFR. Right? So Anil Sadgopal is from TIFR. So Anil, Anil ji went there and he set up Kishore Bharti. Right? So actually people from TIFR, people from Delhi University, people from the better research and higher education institutions, they got engaged in the matter of school education. Right? They got engaged. And there was then this ferment, this not just intellectual, but this social ferment that happened, which really led to what I call the progressive curriculum in this country. So this, that's a wonderful period in India's school education history, 1973 to 85, 86 in, in Madhya Pradesh. Right? Now, therefore, people like you, your friends outside, can play a role, can play a significant role. Uh, that's what we've been discussing. We had a similar discussion a few years ago uh, when Vijay was around here. And uh, Vijay and I talked. And I said, I, I actually was pulling his leg. I said, you know, you guys are here right across the door. And you don't do anything for schools, right? All these wonderful scientists doing nothing for schools. So he said, you know, we, what do you mean by that? We don't know what to do. You know, because we know our lab and this and that. We, can't, we don't know what to do. 
So that's how I, we ended, ended up with Suhail in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that, that's how we got we got involved in this. <laughs> so that's how Season Watch happened, actually, right? From our, we got involved with Season Watch and Season. So Season Watch, I, I, I think some of you might know Season Watch, right? So Season Watch is a very interesting program, uh, which does work between NCBS, not between the foundation. That one is with NCBS and Wipro, right? Uh, but therefore, there's, there are very many things that we could do together. Do together. One of the things that we are exploring currently is the possibility of developing a biology magazine aimed at teachers, right? So the content will come from you, and we'll make sure it's in a language that teachers understand, right? That's the, that's the essence of that thing. <laughs> <laughs>